thank you for joining with me. We are reading from A Course in Miracles, the complete and annotated edition edited by Robert Perry. We're reading with the Course Companions group, and today we are on day 183. We are in chapter 14, The Light of Guiltlessness, and this is section 5, Loving in a Loveless Place. If you would like to close your eyes and join me in prayer. Dear God, please enable me to set aside everything I think I know about A Course in Miracles, about chapter 14, about myself, my brother, this world, and especially you, God. God, please allow me to have an open mind and a new experience with all of these things. Thank you, God. Amen. Loving in a Loveless Place When you accept a brother's guiltlessness, you will see atonement in him. For by proclaiming it in him, you make it yours, and you will see what you sought. You will not see the symbol of his guiltlessness shining within him while you still believe it is not there. His guiltlessness is your atonement. Grant it to him, and you will see the truth of what you have acknowledged. Yet truth is offered first to be received, even as God gave it first to his Son. The first in time means nothing but the first in eternity is God the Father, who is both first and one. Beyond the first there is no other, for there is no order no second or third, and nothing but the first. You who belong to the first cause, and now we will move down to footnote 11. First cause is a term that was originally used by ancient Greek philosophers and from there passed into the Judeo-Christian tradition. It refers to a being that is at the top of all chains of causation, the ultimate cause of everything, but which itself, which, but which is itself uncaused. The first cause argument, also called the cosmological argument, for God's existence, states that since everything must have a cause, and since the change of causation cannot stretch back infinitely, there must have been an uncaused first cause. God, therefore, must exist. You who belong to the first cause created by him, like unto himself and part of himself, are more than merely guiltless. The state of guiltlessness is only the condition in which what is not there has been removed from the disordered mind that thought it was. This state and only this must you attain with God beside you. For until you do, you will still think that you are separate from him. You can feel his presence next to you, but you cannot know that you are one with him. This need not be taught. Learning applies only to the condition in which it happens itself. Footnote 12, pronoun pronoun clarification. Learning applies only to the condition in which it, knowing you are one with him, happens of itself. When you have let all that has obscured the truth in your most holy mind be undone for you and stand in grace before your Father, he will give himself to you as he has always done. Giving himself is all he knows, and so it is all knowledge for what he knows cannot be, for what he knows not cannot be, and therefore cannot be given. Ask not to be forgiven, for this has already been accomplished. Ask rather how to learn forgiveness and restore what always was to your unforgiving mind. Atonement becomes real and visible to them that use it. On earth it is your only function and you must learn that it is all you want to learn. You will feel guilty till you learn this, for in the end, whatever form it takes, 
Your guilt arises from your failure to fulfill your function in God's mind with all of yours. Can you escape this guilt by failing to fulfill your function here? You need not understand creation to do what must be done before that knowledge would be meaningful to you. God breaks no barriers, neither did he make them. When you release them, they are gone. God will not fail, nor ever has in anything. Decide that God is right and you are wrong about yourself. He created you out of him, but still within him. He knows what you are. Remember that there is no second to him. There cannot therefore be anyone without his holiness, nor anyone unworthy of his perfect love. Fail not in your function of loving in a loveless place, made out of darkness and deceit, for thus are darkness and deception undone. Fail not yourself, but instead offer to God and you his blameless Son. For this small gift of appreciation for his love, God will himself exchange your gift for his. Before you make any decisions for yourself, remember that you have decided against your function in heaven and consider carefully whether you want to make decisions here. Your function here is only to decide against deciding what you want in recognition that you do not know. How then can you decide what you should do? Leave all decisions to the one who speaks for God and for your function as he knows it. So will he teach you to remove the awful burden you have laid upon yourself by loving not the Son of God and trying to teach him guilt instead of love. Give up this frantic and insane attempt which cheats you of the joy of living with your God and Father and waking, awaking gladly to his love and holiness which join together as the truth in you making you one with Him. When you have learned how to decide with God, all decisions become as easy and as right as breathing. There is no effort and you will be led as gently as if you were being carried along a quiet path in summer. Only your own volition seems to make deciding hard. The Holy Spirit will not delay at all in answering your every question what to do. He knows, and he will tell you, and then do it for you. You who are tired must consider whether this is not more restful than sleep. For you can bring your guilt into sleeping, but not into this. And now I will read the commentary by Robert Perry. The first time I read this section this morning, I was still sleepy and not particularly struck by it. The second time I read it, it just seemed so beautiful and so sublime. As long as we see guilt in our brother, we lay a terrible burden on our minds. The awful burden you have laid upon yourself by loving not the Son of God. We teach ourselves that we are guilty, not a Son of God. And this means that we assume that we just don't belong with God. To understand why, imagine that you are about to walk in someone's front door. Only this person happens to be the cleanest person on the face of, of the earth and happens to have the cleanest house that exists. And you happen to be absolutely filthy and literally dripping with mud. Would you walk in? That feeling that holds you back from walking into that house is the same feeling that holds you back from walking into heaven. But in believing that you are too dirty for God, you are wrong about yourself. God is not only the first cause, there is no second to him. Interestingly, this same point is made in the Chattadoga, uh, I don't know how to say that, so I'm not going to try. <laughs> he is the one only without a second. This means that nothing is actually additional to him. Everything real is a part of him. You therefore belong to him and are within him. 
How then can he be clean while you are dirty? The way that we come back to him, therefore, is that we remove the dirt that we see on ourselves. We remove, in other words, the guilt that clouds our minds. How do we do so? The section says the same thing in a number of different ways. We accept our brother's guiltlessness. We learn to forgive him. We fulfill our function of loving in a loveless place. Loving your brother doesn't make you holy. It doesn't change you at all. It just cleans off the dirt that had covered your, over your purity. As you see the love pour out of you, you realize, Oh, I'm not guilty afterward. after all. I never was. You are, you are in reality exactly the same after this realization as before. It's just that afterward you finally see the purity that was always the truth about you. This is why you should only ask to learn forgiveness not asked to be forgiven. The first makes you realize the second has always been true. Once you understand that the guilt was never true, then you do at last walk through the front door of heaven. When you have let all that has obscured the truth in your most holy mind be undone for you and stand in grace before your Father, He will give Himself to you, He as He has always done. If a beloved person giving himself or herself to you feels like heaven, then you can understand why God giving himself to you is heaven. The end of this section gives all this a surprisingly down-to-earth application. The way we love the Son of God and thus realize our guiltlessness is we leave all decisions to the One who speaks for God and for our function as He knows it. Letting Him decide for us makes decision-making so much easier. We are spared the usual seesawing anxiety and instead just feel carried along. But more to the point of this section, at the heart of each each of His decisions is the love that saves us from our guilt. Thank you so much for joining with me for Day 182 with the Course Companions, Emily Bennington and Robert Perry, reading Section 5, Loving in a Loveless Place. I love you. Have a beautiful day. And I apologize for my hoarseness. This will get better soon. I love you. Thank you.